Whoops. <laughs> so, what's this look like, you guys? If, if you went out in the desert where I live, you will find this stuff laying all over the place. Um, especially here in the Sierra Estrella. And people call it quartz. Hmm? And, and we're told, you know, in the geology books, that this quartz is uh, um, crypto-crystalline quartz. Uh, that is, that the, the crystallization is so small that you can't actually see it. And um, that's not really true, because what you're looking at here is a crystal. Uh, and, and it's got kind of five sides, right? And, but, but that's just the outline. Um, and, and what it really is, kind of a, a couple of tetrahedrons slipped together, and, and the one goes one way and the other goes the other way. Um, and uh, I may not be holding it exactly the right way, but... Anyway, uh, and, and and it's got planes of cleavage. You can see them, right? Very clearly see planes of cleavage. Those aren't broken parts of the rock. That's part of the crystal structure. Whoops. Turn the light back on. Okay, and, and as we get closer and closer, we can see that there's some structure to the stone uh, that is actually uh, cubic and not uh, hexagonal. And quartz is strictly hexagonal, if, if you can actually find some. I haven't, I've got tons of rocks and I called this quartz for 35 years. Um, up until about a year ago when I finally started taking pictures of it and looking at the structure of it and comparing it to what I actually know about quartz. Uh, and um, um, quartz does not make straight lines, can't make right angles. Ooh, and my camera can't look at that, look at that right angle. You see that right angle? It's not quartz. Because quartz has, um, supposedly, um, four oxygens around each silica atom at 144 degrees. And, and so every quartz crystal is um, the angles of the crystal are multiples of 144 degrees. So like 72 and uh, 36. Um, not 90 and 45, okay? And that's what we have here, 90 and 45. See the 45s there? Ooh, man, I wish my camera could focus, you know? That's 45s. And, and quartz, not, not just doesn't do that most of the time, but sometimes does. Quartz can't because the um, the atomic structure within the crystal is bound by those 144 degree bond angles between the silica and the oxygen atoms. It's not magic. It's not optional. It's not um, dynamic and changes from one rock to the next. The thing about learning about the, the, the geology of, of our planet started with me. Some guy wrote an article and said, uh, you could throw your hat up in the air in Lightning Ridge uh, and wherever it landed would be just as good a place to start digging looking for opal as any place else. And I got mad at that. I, uh, you know, he, he's a pretty famous writer, and he, he wrote some books about cutting opal that I read. And he's a college professor of history, um, not science, history. 
and, and he's a nice guy. I, I met him, and he, you know, he was a smart guy. But he's not a scientist, and, and you know, I, I wasn't either at the time. I, I was uh, um, thinking about going back to school. Married, and I had the opportunity to stay home with my son when he was born, uh, my wife went back to work, and so I started back to school. And I started learning about this stuff and walking around the desert and picking up rocks. That was 35 years ago. And um, I, I'm still going to school. I never got any degrees because I didn't really like need a better job. I had good jobs. Um, so, you know, and school's expensive. I, 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 most of my education came from the library. Libraries, not not just public libraries. When the internet came along, I, I was found the internet in my first um, graduate level geology class, which was in remote sensing. And the teacher was afraid I would not be able to uh, keep up with the math. And, and actually, my little group, the th other two guys and myself, um, took the cake on, on the research that we did. Um, and an algorithm I developed for the software we were using um, was incorporated into the NASA. It was a NASA-sponsored class, and NASA used it, and um, Google Earth uses it in their 3D things. And, and my, my, when I work with the, the Google Babe, she uses it to develop uh, photos by, by looking at shadows. And you see the shadows there? The shadows give us 3D information, and so we can measure those. That's what I've been doing, and photography is, is my lifelong passion. I take pictures of everything all the time. Um, I have a phone with the mega, mega memory, um, and I fill it up about once a month. You know, 250 gigabytes or something like that. And, and I, I take tens of thousands of pictures a month. And mostly of these rocks of mine, so I can figure out how they work. And then I go to the books and I read. Okay, and if you read about quartz, you'll find that it doesn't have planes of cleavage, that its um, crystallization is based on the 144-degree um, bond angles of the silica and oxygen. I didn't make that up. I read it in a book. Okay, and, and I come back to this stuff, and I find... Cubic structure. Can you see it there? Cubic structure. Straight lines and 90 degree angles. It's not quartz. Okay. Also, of course, it's, um, I'm going to pull out a piece of stuff here, Maybe a few pieces. Whoa, man, let's back off a little bit. Okay, this stuff is um, called the uh, um, chevron amethyst. Hmm? Okay. Amethyst is supposedly quartz, um, but there's nothing even resembling hexagonal here. Nothing. And, and those are, are not like the chevrons on the outside. Those are planes of cleavage passing through the stone. And, and these and these over here are the same ones. They're going in different directions, but only if you're looking at it the, the, from the 
other direction. Okay, but they, they cross each other at about 45 degrees. Look at that. How about that? Wow, huh? And, and it has 90 degree angles. You'll always find the, like the corners of a box, kind of like this. And then um, quartz only has a single bond with each oxygen. So it's a, a, a covalent bond because um, it's got four oxygens around it and four electrons in the outer valence orbit. Okay, and, and the, the oxygens pass a, an electron back, and, and so it's a double bond, but it's only a double covalent bond. Diamond, carbon, is just carbon, so it binds with another carbon. And carbon also has four electrons in the outer valence orbit, and these have double, double covalent bonds because of the atomic structure of the atoms. They're all the same size, so they line up in perfect little rows and columns. And they do so at 90 degrees, and they create 90 degree angles. And you can use the mm, sine over cosine and tangent and all of that to figure out these angles, right? And this is face-centered cubic, so you see a point on this side, right in the middle of that cube, um, and a dished-out place on this side, somewhere here. And, and it's not magic, it's physics, it's, it's chemistry, it's also so very, very clear. My, my favorite teacher, Richard Feynman, won the Nobel Prize with his quantum electrodynamics. And one of the things that he talks about is how things are clear. Uh, because w with Einstein's uh, photoelectric effect, when light hits something, that thing uh, raises up a notch and drops back down. So metal drops back down right away and, and you can't see through it, right? You, you, you can't see through metallic bonds. Metallic bonds are just a single electron shared with a neighbor. There's no double part of it. it the, the neighbor doesn't participate. It's sharing with its neighbor on the other side. Uh, and that's how electricity passes. Those electrons go just to the next neighbor. Boop. They only have to travel, you know, a, a couple of nanometers. Um, and we measure those. We, we know what those measurements are, and you can find them in the periodic table. I'm not making it up. I'm just reading stuff out of a book and repeating it back to you here. Um, but when the... When the when the atoms can't stay up at the at that level, and, and that's what those bond angle bonds do, they they provide the energy for it to stay up or or not. And in this case, it drops back down, and the the those atoms release that extra energy as a photon, and so that's why metals are shiny. How about that, huh? Yeah, that's cool. So. And, and I've always thought that was cool. And, and uh, you know, people see this and they go, oh, okay, that's quartz. And, and, you know, it's only a single um, covalent bond. And it's very strong and hard. Um, you know, and you, you try to scratch it with something and it doesn't scratch. Um, but quartz is not really clear because it only has the single covalent bond. Now I'm pointing to this, and this is not quartz. We already figured that out. Neither is this. And it's so clear, it can't possibly be quartz, because it has double, double 
covalent bonds. And it's just carbon. The deeper they form, the color goes from, from uh, purple at the very deepest to red and pink at the very top to clear, right? So kimberlite pipe diamonds are, generally speaking, clear. They don't create many of the deeper diamonds because kimberlite pipes don't go deep enough. Kimberlite pipes are surface phenomena. Fault lines go all the way down to the semi-molten metal, and this stuff comes up in molten rock as... Um, disseminated atoms of carbon. And when it reaches the uh, melting point of carbon, it gets below that melting point, they begin to precipitate out. And this rock floated in that molten rock as a crystal, and it grew as long as there was carbon in the mix around it. Okay, so they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because it's growing like a real crystal. In, uh, in a kimberlite pipe, it's just an asteroid strike and, and uh, um, it's surface minerals, right? It's, it's stuff like this that's already hard um, and you get stuff like, like this one. This is fluorite. Okay, fluorite is five and a half on the Mohs scale of hardness. So I can um, put a scratch on it. Real easy, right? Real easy, because it's soft. This is surface stuff that's left over from, from all the, the molten rock that made the mountains that we... Um, you know, live, the ones I live in, the ones everybody lives in, and basically, um, because the, the rocks of the continents are made up out of this kind of stuff right here. So, and, and these come out first. Diamond comes out uh, first. It, it's the first thing out of the mix because it has the highest melting point. And, and you can look it up. I didn't make that up either, right? I don't make this stuff up, man. I just put it together. I put it together by, first of all, I, I, I didn't actually go to school and I didn't have to regurgitate information to pass tests. I just learned what I wanted to learn about, and, and I, you know, I remember it because I don't watch television, and my memory is very good. It is what people call eidetic memory, it, like um, photographic memory. It's not a photograph. I remember everything I read. I always have. I, I remember everything I read all the way back to the first book I read the yearling, when I was in first grade. And I read Old Yeller when I was in first grade. Um, and then I started everything else, you know. I, mean, I, I uh, was not reading at a first grade level when I was in first grade. Uh, and, uh, you know, because my mom read to me. That's how, you, you want your kids to read, that's how you do it. You read to them. You read out loud. You read to, to each other. My wife and I read to each other all the time. My wife reads. That's why I married her, because she's a reader. And uh, one of the reasons, <laughs> you know, she's a good cook, and she's pretty, and she's smart, and and... She loves animals, and, and she even loves me, which is, you know, worth the price of admission. So, here we have a diamond. 
little scratch anything, right? It's got 10 on the most scale of hardness, and, and on most people's charts, it's the only thing there. But this rock here is actually 10 on the most scale of hardness. I can't scratch it with a diamond. Can't. Even if I try really hard, I can't scratch it with a diamond. That, that stuff just goes away because it's little bits and pieces of my diamond left behind on the, uh, on the rock here. And, um, and it's heavy. Very heavy. So it's not a diamond. Diamonds uh, don't weigh very much because they're just carbon. And, and even big ones. Uh, a big one this size would be, uh, oh, five times smaller. I mean, you know, five times less weight, less mass than the same volume of this stuff. Because this stuff is actually, I, I, I believe, platinum and gold and and that's what all this red stuff is um, platinum actually has a, a red uh, um, salt uh, with nitrogen and, and in um, reducing environments with low oxygen um, it forms a nitrate salt uh, that's red and so that's part of what we see here um, but AUPT is um, kind of ubiquitous, and, and uh, as this rock started, uh, it was also, you know, part of the molten rock, right? Way deep, 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 deep in the earth. Didn't form out of the water or anything else. It formed from molten rock. And the gold reaches its vapor point and begins to, it's attracted to the platinum because they create a north-south orientation. And um, they bind together with double, double covalent bonds. So this is platinum with little um, bits of AUPT in the planes of cleavage. And they make um, faith-centered cubic. That's what this X is that you see at 45 degree angles and 90 degree angles. And they make cubes. Think about all the beach sand you've seen. We're told that glass comes from beach sand. I'm still working on that one. 